right. So hopefully my voice is not as bad as it sounds to me, but uh, I I have a chapter to record for you guys, and I'm finally able to speak without just coughing incessantly. So let's get started. Holy Toledo. I am I'm I'm having a really hard time recording this. Let's assume we don't have any problems with this one. <laughs> Chapter 9. We read it. Uh I there's a lot of philosophy in this, which is funny. We have this idea of recoverable versus non-recoverable or unrecoverable errors. And we give the first example of unrecoverable errors with panic, our panic macro. Um because they're really easy to understand. We've gotten into a state that's so bad, we just don't want to continue. And that's a smart thing to do because oftentimes if you try to take some sort of garbage and you turn it into something good, you're making a lot of assumptions there. And that can lead to unexpected behavior. I don't want to say undefined behavior, unexpected behavior. And oftentimes it's just better to enforce the contracts that you wrote. So I will just say when I write a lot of things, I kind of treat this panic as my default go-to because I'm just starting something out. I want it to explode. It's like a compiler error. It's literally like, I don't know what I'm working with. Just stop. And later, once I kind of start writing things and I have a good feeling about what I'm writing, I get a little bit more defensive. Uh, defensive in the way that I program so that it can it can handle those kind of errors versus our recoverable errors, which are, we don't know exactly how this needs to be implemented. Let's say we're writing a library, say we need this code to ship out to a bunch of different people. If it breaks, don't just stop everything, like tell them where it broke and hopefully get that information back to the person who's either implementing this code or the person who uses the library so that they can make appropriate changes and fix stuff. And so it talks about this in our uh, to panic or not to panic on 175. And so it goes into kind of whether or not we're writing a library, what we expect. I don't really know how I feel about the way that these guidelines are written out. It's, it talks about bad state, which I alluded to, but to be explicit, it's like when you cannot make any assumptions about how the program should run from here. Like something is so wrong that you just stop. If we're in that bad state, panicking is probably the smartest thing to do to error hard so that we know where those errors exist. I know that there are asserts in other languages, and I feel like this is kind of the spot that I would have put in the idea of asserting something, which in this case, you could just have your if statement and then panic, right? That's still valid. I, I, I don't know exactly the way that it described it. It felt like it was it was maybe lacking something. Uh, and that was kind of reinforced by the end of the chapter in some of the examples they gave. I'll just say my theory here and let me know if you, if you disagree, if you have different expectations, but I, I tend to say that if I'm writing something that I know I'm in control of, let's say I'm prototyping something or it's a script that I use. Um, it's not something I'm giving to everybody all over the place. I would put panics everywhere. The reason I do that is because I consider what I'm writing as a function very explicit, right? Like I, when it has an error, I want to handle that error when it arises. And so if it, if I have an error, just break, cause then I know exactly where it broke and then I can fix it where the problem arises. The bad garbage stuff is right here. I need to check where that, where that's coming from or how I handle it right there. The, the book describes that as a contract, right? It says functions often have contracts. Their behavior is only guaranteed if the inputs meet particular requirements. I've heard this as, um, guy go or garbage in garbage out. If you get garbage, you can't, you can't fix that just because you, you want to. Sometimes it's better to just stop. I think that, I think that's generally my strategy. It's obviously not the strategy if I'm like writing a library because I can't just break the program when I get something bad. The person who's implementing that needs to know that it's bad so that they can fix it or change the way that they're processing information and, and passing it into the library. And if I'm writing something that needs to be shared with other people, it's better to explain what I was expecting. If only we had like an expect call. <laughs> anyway, that makes sense. I think the logic the book describes here for unrecoverable versus non-recoverable errors makes sense. Uh, so 
I already talked about panic. Cool. Let's go on to some of these recoverable errors so that we can talk about how the book kind of lays it out and some other questions that I had along the way. Oh, I'm such a bad person. Uh, I should script these things, right? I did have two small things to say about uh, the panic macro. Uh, first off, it returns uh, no backtrace, and we can turn that on by setting an environment variable. That's useful and important because we don't want to, that information, that toggle to be baked into the binary. Uh, we might need to check that later and we don't necessarily want to have that backtrace printed all the time. Maybe it gets to the end user and that's not great for what our program does. All that's fine. So uh, we actually can turn that on with an environment variable and our binary doesn't need to change. That's cool. In the cases where we want the binary to either have some information encoded into it or not, we have two examples. Uh, one is our abort inside of our cargo toml, which is like when we hit a panic, th all the memory that's there, it's expected that the operating system cleans that up, not us. Like we're not going to clean up anything before we just break. And so we have that as something that's baked into the binary itself that is set in our cargo toml. And the, the other one is when we're actually building something with either cargo build or cargo run, if we emit the dash dash release flag, that means that we can have all of our debugging symbols in the actual program in the binary that we're creating. And that makes it easier to debug stuff. But when we're, we're in a release setting, we don't want those symbols there because yeah, we're shipping out a binary or something like that. And it, we, it doesn't behoove us to share that information with whoever ends up using our binary. So there's a difference there between whether or not something's baked into the binary or whether or not something's uh, outside of that with like an environment variable. Okay, so recoverable errors. We have a bunch of different ways we've seen this thus far. Uh, we can match against a result or an option. We've seen that throughout the book should be somewhat familiar to us at this point. And it starts off by going to the most verbose example that we can, which would be, well, we, we have listing 9.4, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit that. We're going to talk about listing 9.5, where we want to, let's say, look at a particular error type and then do something different based upon the error type. So we have an example where we're trying to open a file. And if that file doesn't exist, well, let's create it. And if the file does exist, we, we still might have an error there where, where we don't have permissions to read it. So we have two different types of errors, but the, the control flow is different based upon the error. We actually can use this error kind here and then match against that error kind, right? Error.kind and use that typing uh, of the error to control what happens. So if it's not found, we create that file. And then later we can match against the error, which is like, I don't have permissions to open this. And I, I think that's actually really cool. Um, I, I'm glad it gave us this example first because every once in a while you do want to do something like that. I, I wouldn't, uh, the hello TXT was a little bit interesting because it's just an example, right? Um, but I, I've used this exact pattern in other languages where you have like a config file where the user can change some things about, you know, what's defined where. And if that doesn't exist, that config file, you can use kind of a control flow like this. Instead of saying like, let's check the file system for that file, you can just say, try to open this. I got the error. Okay, it doesn't exist. I'll write it. I'll make that config file. And so I, I like this control flow. I've seen it. I've used it. I think it's great. Some silly thing about the actual example, though, that I thought was funny. It just shows that not, not all of this information sticking in my head. Uh, this other error, I kind of expected it to be an underscore, um, mainly because back in our matching examples, oh, man, I did a great flip there. I was like right on the money. Uh, on 115 in Chapter 6, it gave us this dice roll. We matched on the 3 and then the 7, and then if we didn't match that, we had some other example, right? So we move the player that number of steps, sure. Uh, small example, but we didn't use the underscore here. Well, <laughs> immediately after, it gives us this else case where we do use an underscore, which is like, I don't need the information. I don't care about what the state was in that else case. And for whatever reason, my brain only remembered the underscore as like the, you do your matches and then you have an underscore for the else case versus you create a variable. Um, I'm not sure if it's a variable. You create something that you can reference uh, in that in that branch arm or in the match kind of arm. And so, yeah, I, I don't know why, but I was like, other error, where is that defined? And it's funny looking back at stuff. It's like, that was literally the first example they gave you, bro. Uh, so silly. Anyway, uh, from here, the book goes into unwrap and expect. 
Uh, I have been using expect because when I see errors that include text that I wrote, like here's what I was expecting, it's easier for me to fix. But we also uh, have the unwrap, which is the exact same thing. We just don't include any text on it. And to kind of reinforce how ubiquitous these are, we ended up uh, talking about this question mark operator. There's a little bit more nuance there, and this maybe is a little bit of the philosophy side of things. Uh, I, th I think I mentioned, I feel like you should handle errors when they take place. And propagating errors is a is a is exactly what we're doing with this question mark operator, and I'll talk about that in a sec, but it feels kind of bad to me. And I'm not exactly certain how to describe why it feels bad, but imagine some sort of pseudo language where we can take any number of lines and say, if an error happens inside of these lines, I want you to do something. So like some control flow like that. Uh, try accept is commonly how I've seen that kind of pattern referred to. If I have my code in every function in a try accept, and then in the exception, I don't handle that error, I feel like that is an anti-pattern. It's not helpful. So I, I catch an error here, and then later I just would say, okay, continue to pass that error up. It feels bad. It feels like I didn't handle the error, I just wrote more lines of code. I, I don't think this is exactly the same thing, right? Um, I'm saying eventually it needs to be handled. You are going to handle this, but I don't I don't have the a priori knowledge of how it ought to be handled in your circumstance. So I, I'm writing a library, I'm doing something like that. So it makes sense when we propagate these errors in this example. However, generally, I feel like you should handle errors where they show up. And maybe that's the difference between writing like small tools versus writing large sophisticated things, but it feels a little bit strange to me. It, it feels almost axiomatic. It's like you handle the errors when they show up. Propagating errors is like half handling them. You're more like, this is somebody else's problem. They can deal with it. Anyway, listing 9.6. So there's a couple small things to talk about here. We have a result type that we are, we're concerned with. It's fortunate because this example has two places that it can error and they both return the same error type, this IO error. So our result contains what we would like to return and then the type of all of the things inside of here that we need to catch. And that's fine, right? Like we return that error here and then in our read string, we also return that error. This is not necessarily great though because we don't, we don't know if everything inside of any particular function that we need to handle is going to be the exact same error type. But it's, it's pointing that out because it's like, here's why this code works. So it's, it's a good example, but it, it kind of begs the question immediately after, like how do we write our own errors? How do we raise our own errors when we hit them? Not necessarily when we get an error, what do we do with it? But like, let's say I'm writing something and then I know this is bad, I want to raise an error. The book doesn't really show us how to do that here. And it gets close to it. It gets really close to it. So for the first thought, second thing about 9.6 is that we have this file object. We actually have our username file result, which is the output of file open. And so there can be an error associated with this that we need to handle, makes sense. But then we have this read to string, which is using the actual, we know that this has returned something. Now try to read from it. And this read to string feels like it is a, a, a method <laughs> of this file struct. I don't think it is. I think it's in this use stdio read. It, it makes sense that it would be from there, but there's no other place where we call like capital read, read to string, whatever, right? Like that's being called on this username file. So it feels like it should exist in file. I'm not sure if that m makes sense, why that's still confusing to me, but fingers crossed, it's not complicated because I installed Rust Analyzer. <laughs> uh, this is another thing I needed to talk about. I, I finally installed that. Why you want me to have NPM on my machine, I, I, I don't know, but it's okay. We had an example where we're returning a result from this file open and it gives us the return types. It tells us the return types, the book does, uh, with standard file system file or standard IO error. Uh, I want to see this when I write file open. I want to see these two guys in the result uh, right afterwards. So then I know and I can change whatever the return type is. I, I finally installed that. 
hopefully that makes sense and hopefully it clears up 9.6 why we would need to import standard IO read or where this read to string actually exists. Okay, so next thing in the book, um, just to prove that there's nothing up my sleeves, I'm not trying to sound like a smart person here. I had a hard time remembering the difference between result and option here because uh, we started learning about the question mark operator and it makes a big point of that. And right before that, I was a little bit con concerned. I was like, wait, so I thought that the question mark operator had to do with option, not result. Why do they need to be different? And the typing information makes it obvious. Option is handling whether or not something exists null or not. And result is whether or not there's an error, right? So we want that type. T maybe is the same thing, depending upon wh whether we want to use option or result. But one has error information associated with it. So that's a thing to point out. Anyway, I'm not a perfect reader. Some things don't stick. Uh, apart from that, we then finally get to our question mark operator, which basically makes this idea of handling the errors that can exist from result and also the none cases from option much easier. So instead of calling unwrap, instead of calling accept, instead of matching it, we can just put a question mark at the end of it. And it gives us the same example we were using before. So instead of actually matching after we get our username file to see whether or not this actual file exists, we have this question mark and that will take an error if it exists and propagate it up through our return type, result string IO error, or it'll get the actual value and then assign that into username file. Really cool. It's silly because I wrote here, doesn't this need to be an option return type? And it's because in the last episode when I was trying to use the question mark, uh, I thought that's what the error was telling me. It needs to return an option. And it actually gives us an error here. Yeah, okay. The compiler error. Uh, this function return result or option. So I was like, I thought it was only option. So it just goes to show uh, reading with understanding. It, it's hard to do. Moreover, in the return types of the question mark, uh, you can't handle an option case with a question mark in a function that returns a result. And you also cannot handle a result type in a function that returns an option. And it says so explicitly later on, on page 174. The question mark operator won't automatically convert a result to an option or vice versa. So we know that in those cases, we would need to match, unwrap, or accept whatever that error is. The other little bit of nuance for the question mark operator is it casts the error. So in the case that both this read to string and file open didn't return the exact same error type, we can actually have our result error be whatever kind of error we want. That way, this question mark operator will actually cast that error into the new error for our return type, and that works actually pretty well. We haven't really learned a whole lot about types, traits, all that stuff. That's actually the next chapter. Um, but we get little hints of it, like leading us into here's why this is useful. For example, at the end of 171, we see if we also define implement from IO error for our error to construct an instant of our error from an IO error, then the question mark operator in the body will <laughs> we'll call from and convert the error types without needing to add any more code to the function. So like, it's just saying we'll, we'll cast our error to what you want your error type to be. That sentence was hard for me to read. I, I kind of pause on it. And I was also like, we're implementing this, this feels like types and traits and stuff that it, we've learned a little bit about, but haven't made explicitly clear. Uh, the book also gave that example uh, towards the end of 174, 175, it says the main function uh, returns any types that implement the standard process termination trait, which contains a function report, which returns an exit code, and then talks about, you know, you read the documentation if you need to know more, because we haven't gotten to that, that topic yet. But it's another example where it's like, here, we're learning a little bit about where these traits are and how they're used inside of the language um, before it explicitly tells us. I like that. Um, it's a little bit hard to understand whether or not I need to understand that at this point. Suspending my disbelief, I'm not, I, can't, I have a hard time doing it. So I appreciate that they're willing to tell us that information here. It even says so in certain parts. It's like, we'll learn about this in page like 400. Yeah, at the end of 174, it says, you can read about uh, trait objects that allow for values of different types, but it's on page 400 and you're not on page like 200 yet. So you have a ways to go. Like I'm okay suspending my disbelief as long as it's explicit and it tells me. Okay, so I've been talking a little bit uh, here about the way that this book is laid out. And I, I'm not complaining, I haven't written a book. I, I, I'm just, the things that I'm a little bit 
curious about, I tend to rabbit hole myself in. And so maybe this is just useful if you find yourself in a similar situation to me. Pedagogy, right? How do we how do we teach things correctly? I like the way that it starts laying out this this chapter. Here's like the most verbose, here's a slightly less verbose, here's the question mark operator, which makes it easier for you to just write out the code but propagates these errors up and then here we'll take the examples where we're using a question mark we'll make them even more terse so from like 97 to 98 to then 99 we get more and more brief by saying the exact same thing so in our example on 97 we actually create this username file variable and then we actually use that we call read to string on it and get the variable out. It's like, you know, you don't actually have to create that. You could just have the question mark and then call read to string immediately after it. We, we don't need to let anything for whatever that file handle is. And I like that. That makes sense. It's more brief. And then immediately after it goes, you probably don't need to actually implement standard file system file and standard IO read. You could just import standard file system. And there's this method here, read to string, which does all this stuff already. Uh, I highlighted this. I'll just read it out real quick. The standard library provides the convenient file system read to string function that opens a file, creates a new string, reads the contents of the file, and puts the contents into that string and returns it. This is great. This is super great. One of the things that I kind of get stuck in and like thrash around with when I'm trying to understand how everything works, let's say we're talking about like C. I want to open a file. Okay, what is the type of that file? How is the file like terminated? Uh, am I reading that as like blocks? Am I reading it into a buffer? Uh, how do I handle the file handle for that? Am I, am I making sure I close it in all the error cases? Well, now I need to malloc some sort of array of characters for this. Well, that also depends on whether or not I know that it's going to be a file that contains bytes versus characters. Well, are the characters ASCII? Are they uniform in length? And you see how like all those questions can make it really hard to get anything done. And when you have a, a language that's that has these functions like this file system read to string, it makes life so much easier even though you have the control and specificity on the low level to control what's happening. And I love this. I wanted to point out the, how great this kind of stuff actually is. It makes it an actual usable language for weird uh, neurotic people like me. Speaking of weird neurotic, um, it immediately talks about how we can use a question mark operator in main, which is something I tried to do last episode. And I was like, ah, it'll probably tell me in a little bit. And it does. Um, it goes to say we need to change the return type of main to this result uh, unit struct and box din error. If you're like me and go, what is that? It says, don't worry, we'll tell you on page 400. For now, you can just use it. It's okay. And also uh, it whether or not we get an error in main determines the actual return type or return code of that function being called. So piping stuff in, in Unix and stuff still works, which is great. The last thing I guess I should say is still a kind of theory and pedagogy. So uh, we talked this whole time about recoverable versus non-recoverable errors. And we come to an example where we're like, wouldn't it be nice if we could kind of ensure and, and enforce some of these. And that example is 913. I want to be honest, this uh, example was weird for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, we use our guessing code. Well, in that guessing code, we, we were using that error as a recoverable error. We ask the user for input, we check whether or not that's valid input with a match. But then we'd also say, if it's not between the right values, that's bad ask again for another v value there, ask for input again. That's a way to handle that error, it's recoverable. In 9.13, we went from making a recoverable error to being a panic, which feels like this would have been a better example for us to implement, I'm not sure exactly what it was called, let's find out, standard error error, and have like raise our own error, which we could then handle in this init function, like wherever we're implementing that init function. Uh, not implementing this, but like the code that uses it. Um, and we don't, we just raise a panic. So we, we then just terminate the program if the user gives bad input. I know that this is an example. It's just trying to teach us. This is the structure of the way we would use private variables, uh, private attributes inside of structs with getters and setters. That's fine. This is fine. However, <laughs> uh, I don't like the way that the first off that, that the, the program example is is it, it says we have something unrecoverable when we already know it is recoverable but two this touches on something that's i'm a, a little sensitive to which is it's it's kind of our our first feelings 
of object-oriented inside of Rust. And I've already said before, I'm not a huge fan of object-oriented design. So why is this good? Okay, I'll, I'll be very clear. When we need to gate the attributes of something, we need to make sure that they're not accessible everywhere and that they can't be overwritten and potentially break state of our program. Uh, private makes sense, but it, there's ways that that can go wrong. So I'll just talk about my regular workflow here uh, and hopefully it makes sense. I'm not very smart. That's probably well known to you at this point. When I'm writing something, I cannot know the entire state of a system before I start writing code. I kind of need to feel out this space. And then I can say, oh, here's a pattern. Oh, here's a pattern. Actually, this data is the same. Doing that kind of thing to me is important because every time that I try to come up with a big system design and then just like write that all perfectly, I make assumptions that are wrong and that end up costing me a lot of time later. I'm sure that there are people out there that can do it. I just know myself where I'm at, wisdom wise, skills wise, that's not, it's not fruitful. And so when we're talking about like learning material, uh, I also don't want to assume that whoever's reading this is all, like one of these special people that are able to hold a whole system in their head before they start writing code. Because I'm not very smart and I need to kind of braille my way through whatever problem I hit, I don't use private. I don't use private until I need to. So every attribute for every struct I would use would be public. And that way I can get something working I can say here, I need to ac access this attribute. So I just access it and I modify it and I change it. Once I get something working, then and only then I stop and I look at it and I say, this particular attribute, if changed somewhere else in the code, would cause problems. It does deserve to be private in some sense. Then I also have to ask, if I'm making it private, does it need to be used outside of this class and things implementing this class? If it does, the getter and the setter ought to do something. And they do in this case, right? Our, our setter, our initializer here has this if check. And so we know wherever we're using this value, it, it is in fact a value between one and a hundred. And that's fine, that works great. In fact, it's a, it's a signed integer, which is weird. It should be, it doesn't matter. They talk about that here. Point is, um, we know that in baked into this actual attribute is all the uh, business logic that's important to us. That's great. But what I often see is people make something private and then they write getters and setters that don't have any business logic in it, which means you're just writing all this boilerplate that doesn't really get you anything. It's kind of a, a, a ritual, a pattern, uh, some sort of like tradition that people just do and they don't actually think about it. And so later when they get to a spot where they are architecting something large and sufficiently important, this lesson clicks and they go, oh wow, I spent the last three years just writing a bunch of boilerplate getters and setters that did nothing. By having all of our attributes private by default, Rust is hopefully making us think about this, right? I just don't know if me learning this book, let's say Rust was the first language I was trying to learn. I am sorry, uh, but if, if Rust was the first language I was trying to learn, I might not know that, that lesson there. I might not have the wisdom to understand why getters and setters without any business business logic are just kind of dumb. And I would write a lot of code that would be silly and would be very similar to the, you know, throwing of essential oils and speaking Latin and crossing our fingers that I don't like. There's a, there's a good reason why. And the book's also very explicit about this. It says so at the end of 179. This public method is necessary because the value field of guest struct is private. It's important that the value field be private so that the code using the guest struct is not allowed to set the value directly, right? Like you set this value and then later I'm like, I ah, change that value to something else. If I can do that, i.e. this is public, then I've lost the check of my business logic. Fine, it makes sense. But, but, and it's a big but, you have to know that that's why this exists. That's exactly, this, this, you know, two sentence thing here is the check you need to do whenever you make something private. Otherwise you've, you've earned yourself nothing. I, I feel like maybe this is me just like I, because you know, I read through stuff and I just wanted to get something done. I wasn't thinking about these things. And then I wrote a lot of code that one cost me a lot of time and two made me overthink and kind of spiral in weird places later when I did finally figure it out, like, what am I missing? I think maybe I'm doing a little bit of that here. Anyway, 
uh, we we finally we finally read through all this. You've heard me ramble enough. Let's go to a computer and actually learn some stuff. Hello there. Virtual me here. Uh, everything is in one main file today, so hopefully this is easy to walk through. Firstly, uh, I wanted to just say Rust Analyzer seems to be working okay, but it overwrote some of the standard Vim things that I do. For example, if I wanted to uh, reference, I don't know, read file, whatever, uh, immediately it prompts with this giant thing, uh, and you can access it with the Control-P the same way that you would regularly, uh, but it pops up all the time, uh, and I'm not used to it yet. So just pointing out, uh, it's there, I just, I haven't read the manual on it. Let's go to the first example, read file, uh, handle, error types. I don't know, I tried to be verbose, it's the same thing over and over and over. One thing that I was hopeful that this would show when I run file open is, yes, it has this result and then file and error, but the error type isn't explained here, which would be this standard IO error. Uh, I actually broke this up from the example code uh, instead of in including self here. Uh, I just added read and then error kind. And yeah, I was hopeful it'd be a little bit more verbose. Maybe there's a, a setting I need to toggle. Most of the code here actually makes a lot of sense. It works fine. I had a little bit of trouble uh, just writing this from memory. I tried to write it because I read the book, assuming that I learned it rather than just like referring back to the code. Sorry, referring back to the text. And uh, I struggled a bit. So we're at a precipice where it's probably good for me to spend more time here than looking at the book. Beyond that though, matching works perfectly fine. Everything was cool. And we went on to some other examples. We have our obvious and very familiar unwrap and expect. Works perfectly fine. I didn't have to do anything uh, interesting here. Though I will say because we have our return result here, uh, I needed to actually, once I unwrapped everything, uh, and I guess I should say expected everything, once I handled my errors, I had to wrap it in OK for it to actually return. Otherwise, I'm not returning this result string, I'm just returning a string. Moving on, we had our question mark syntax. So this is the more verbose one where we actually instantiate this greeting file result, and later we ended up calling it. Uh, Rust error didn't necessarily make it super obvious why uh, this read to string uh, needed to import this read up here. So if I undo that, it should throw an error. Yes. So we see this read to string uh, and it just has no method, uh, at least found in file. So I, I was right. My hunch was right that the read was required for read to string uh, to be actually used, but it's strange because it does appear to be called from file. So we'll take a look at that, hopefully, uh, and I have a strong feeling it's going to be explained in the traits for the next chapter, so stay tuned. And lastly, for our question mark operator, we had our super terse one. So uh, we actually have this uh, hello txt question mark, right? We don't have to make a new variable for that. And then we can have a question mark at the end of our read to string on the same line. Works perfectly fine. So n worth pointing out that this is a result. If I changed this to an option here, it would be mad because we're handling result in this case and we can't, I'm air quoting here, cast uh, the output from a result into an option. I included this example. I'm not sure if I spoke about it in the text, but I'll speak on it a little bit here. We are using the question mark to handle a circumstance where a file, or I guess I shouldn't say a file, a, a string, with containing new lines uh, may not actually have something when we call next, right? So next is handling an option. And obviously that's the case. We have this option character that's going to be returned here. And I thought it was a little strange that we only have to handle one case here, which is this particular next call, right? We have some text that comes in, it has new lines. So we call lines on it, that presumably gives us an iterator. And then we went to grab the first element of that iterator. So we call next and there's a problem there, right? Like if text is empty, then this is not going to exist. It returns an option and that makes sense. Uh, but then we have a similar pattern immediately after we call, we call characters. This presumably <laughs> returns an iterator of characters and we call last on it. So if this next exists, we're assert we we can somewhat plainly say that this guy uh, needs to test something, and it's silly when it's made obvious, but it threw me off at first. Uh, if I did, oops, sorry, 
my comments are not what I thought they would be. If I change this so that it's returning a character, it will, it'll yell because last is actually returning an option. So I'm unintentionally not handling this last here. The pattern that I was noticing is correct, but if I wanted to use the question mark there, like I'm handling that error, it would mean that I have to say uh, this, let, I, this is a type char. <laughs> let this equal that. Uh, and then I'd have to say return okay for C and we'd be back to a happy place. At least I think. Ah, okay, so we have uh, a result here. I can, I think it's sum, return sum C and then that's okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> option and result, they're different things, who'd have thunk? And finally, we have our main function where we're actually changing the return type to our result unit struct and box din error and now we can use a question mark in it. So in this read to string, uh, the hopefully most ubiquitous and standardized way of doing all the things we've done thus far, uh, we can have a question mark and that handles the result. It will take that output if it exists, put it in output, and then we can print it. And when we run this, we will get our output. Look at the output, yay, it, it executed from main. Uh, I think if I do echo dollar sign question mark, it shows that the return code zero. If we were to remove our main, oops, whoa, that was that was almost a bad time. Uh, if we remove our main txt and then run this again, we see we get an error, uh, code two, not found. And then if we actually look at the error of that, uh, I get an error code of one, which is a little interesting. Uh, the OS error that this is printing out uh, here, what, what the question mark is handling, um, seems to have a different code than what it gave me, but it, I guess it doesn't particularly matter right now, just knowing that zero is a success case. And so if you're using the output of this, you're piping it into other stuff, it will work appropriately. Uh, I also think that we can show that this is going to standard error uh, rather than standard out. I cleaned up a little bit. Uh, if we do this exact same code with cargo run to dev null, I'm saying take everything in standard error and throw it away. And since that main didn't exist, well, now we have a problem. Let's make it again and run this again and we just get our output look, I exist. So all of the warning, building, and error codes that we were saying all exist in standard error, and that makes perfect sense. Cool, so I am going to forego the joys of jumping back to my desk and just say uh, this was a lot more thinking and reading than writing code. Uh, hopefully we have more examples in the future where we're actually doing code and, and, and exercising the skills that we're hopefully learning. And yeah, lastly, I guess I just wanna say I read every comment. So if you guys have any takes or disagree with me, uh, let me know and uh, we can yell and scream about it like regular people do on the internet. Bye.